Numerical Computation, Chapter 3, Video 5. In this video, we will go through the derivation for the algorithm used to compute natural cubic splines. So this might be a pretty long video. As we outlined in the previous video, the algorithm is derived backwards. So we start from S double derivative. So let's define these values zi. zi will be S double prime at ti for i from 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to n minus 1 because z0 and zn will be 0 because our condition for the natural cubic spline. Now we need to pay attention here. These zi's are actually our unknowns. They will be in the end our primary unknowns. Okay? So let's use this notation hi, which denotes length of the interval number i. So it's ti plus 1 minus ti. With that notation in hand, we can write out the Lagrange form for the s double prime of i on the ith interval. So it's just a linear polynomial. It's a straight line going through zi to zi plus 1 from ti to ti plus 1. Okay. So write out its Lagrange form, it takes this form. So um, this is the cardinal function at um, ti plus 1, so it's x minus ti over hi, and at ti the cardinal function is x minus ti minus 1 over negative hi, where we move the negative in the front. So the advantages of writing this in the Lagrange form versus the point-slope form will be clear later on in the derivation. And now we're going to integrate this function once to get s prime and then one more time to get s. So we see when we reached s we did twice integration and there shall be two arbitrary constants. These two constants are really arbitrary also in the way you represent them. So we have a freedom of choosing which way to represent these two arbitrary constant. And here is our choice. And this is actually another little trick along the way. So S double prime is now written in this form. And there, are, there is the arbitrary constant. And then we write it as Ci minus Di. They are both constants and both at the time being arbitrary. So... um. One can easily verify that, taking this expression on the right-hand side and differentiated once in x, and you will exactly recover the s double prime. So this s prime is an antiderivative of the s double prime here. And then integrate it one more time, we recover the expression for si, which takes this form. Okay, So um, here... If you differentiate this term, you get that one. And if you differentiate this term, you get this one. And if you differentiate this term, you get ci. And if you differentiate the last term, you get negative di. So this si is an antiderivative for this s prime. So I advise you to maybe sit down with a piece of paper and write these functions out and check by yourself that these are actually the correct form. We now check various properties that has to be satisfied by the cubic spline. The first property is the interpolating property. So si at ti must interpolate the value yi. So imposing that we get in the expression of si we set x equals to ti and this shall equal to yi. And then the function exactly takes this form as we have here, and you see the hi and hi cube can be um, simplified into exactly this form. So we see there is no ci involved, we only have a di here, and then yi is all given, so one can write the di in terms of the others. So uh, some algebraic manipulation now give me this expression for di. And next, the other interpolation property on the interval 
from Ti to Ti plus 1. On the right, at Ti plus 1, my Si must interpolate the value Yi plus 1. So putting in x equals to Ti plus 1 in the expression of Si of x, I get this expression by just some very simple um, algebraic calculation. And we see that Di is not present, and Ci is the only one here, and I can write ci in terms of the others, some simple manipulation now gives me this form. So at any point of this video, you can push the pause button and to think about these algebraic manipulations and probably work it out on your own. Now we can conclude that once the zi's are known, by some way, if we find the zi's, then we can use the zi's to find my ci's and my di's. And once the ci's and di's are known, and then I can plug back in and I can find the expression for si and s prime of i. So here are actually the expressions. So the si and the s prime i after I plug in the values for ci, that's a ci, and that's di, and then over here is ci minus di, so what I did was when ci is minus in di, I collect the terms containing y's together here, and the terms containing z's together here. So think about it, we what conditions we have not used yet. We have used the property that SI interpolates the data, so S is a continuous function. We have used the property that S double prime interpolates the data ZI, so S double prime is a continuous function. What about the continuity of S prime? Let's check that. So s prime needs to be a continuous function. So it says at any inner point ti approaching from the left must equal to the value approaching from the right to ti. And let's first check the value approaching from the right. Plugging in x equals to ti in the expression of si prime of x, I get this expression. And I see that um, the term here, which I underlined, it is actually the data. So it depends on yi's and hi's, which will be given once your data set tiyi is given. So we'll call this term here bi to shorten the notation. Okay, so after some simplification, getting rid of one of the hi's, and this simply takes this form on for s prime i at ti. And now we can also write out the function s i minus 1 prime at x and then substitute x with ti and this is the function that we'll have. You might want to sit down with a piece of paper and uh, go through the algebras to get this expression. Now we can set them to be equal to each other, that is, this expression here equals to this expression, and we arrange the terms and we collect like terms because there are um, um, several zi and we can collect them. So after cleaning up, and this is the expression we have, so for each i from 1, 2, all the way to n minus 1, the inner knots, I have an equation, and this equation involves three of such z's. It involves zi, and then it involves the zi minus one, the knot on the left, and the zi plus one on the knot on the right. Okay, and we have the boundary condition: z zero is zero, and zn is zero. So in the end, this is a system of n minus one linear equations, where my unknowns are these zi's. See that? So be careful, these zi's are my unknowns, and these hi's are actually the coefficient. So if you want to solve this in MATLAB, we need to write it in matrix vector form. 
Okay, so here we repeat the equations up here, and then we try to write it into a matrix vector form, where we call the matrix capital H, and the unknown vector is Z, and the right-hand side is B. So let's see what is the coefficient matrix X. You can see for the first row, um, when I equals to 1, this equation will contain Z0, Z1, and Z2. And since Z0 is 0, so the first term is gone, and I actually only have Z1 and Z2. So I have two coefficients, this for the Z1 and that's for the Z2. And then for the second row, where I equals to 2, then I see I have actually Z1 and Z2 and Z3. So the coefficients in front of them will be filling the position on the first column, second column, and third column. Let's go one more step. When I equals to 3, I see that I have Z2, Z3, and Z4. So the coefficients will fill in the second and the third and the fourth column, which gives me H2, 2 times H2 plus H3, and H3 here. And one can see that as I increases these triple, kind of a triplet of coefficients, will just move down along, kind of around the diagonal. So let's say you move to um, the second last one, where you still have three um, z's, say i equals to n minus 2, then you will have zn minus 3, zn minus 2, and zn minus 1, so which will give you this h here, and 2 times this 2h here, and this h here. And then for the last equation, when i equals to n minus 1, we see this will be zn, which can be eliminated by using the boundary condition zn is 0. So I have two terms, um, z n minus 1 and the Zn minus 2, which contributes to these two coefficients in my H matrix. And outside these three diagonal lines, everything over here and over here, there are zeros. So such a matrix, which has only non-zero element along the diagonal, the upper diagonal and the lower diagonal, it's called a tridiagonal matrix. And we also notice that this is a symmetric matrix. So symmetric matrix have very nice properties. For example, all the eigenvalues are real. And we also see that this is diagonal dominant in the sense that the diagonal element in absolute value is bigger than the sum of all the off diagonal elements adding up in absolute value, which we can easily verify. Okay, So diagonal dominant matrix are non-singular, which means invertible, which means there'll be a unique solution. Okay, so here the z vector will be my unknown, z1, z2, z3, all the way to zn minus 1, and the b vector is the right-hand side, which is just this number here, and we fill in in the corresponding place. Let's summarize the algorithm. So in the end, how would you compute it? In what order? So we see that we actually needed to set up the matrix vector equation first. Once we set that up, and we have to solve it for the z and find all the z's. And once the z's are found, and then we know we can use the z's to compute the ci's and di's, and in terms we can decide what the si's will be. Now programming for the code of this natural cubic spline um, will take quite some work. So um, the MATLAB code for this will actually be provided to you. So your job will be understanding the algorithm and then go and read the code and understand what the MATLAB code is doing and learn how to use those predefined functions that are provided to you. And you might also want to take a look at the video on the MATLAB simulations for the natural cubic spline. Okay, bye. See you next time.